This podcast is brought to you by Villanova University on iTunes U. Please visit us on itunes.villanova.edu. Well, thank you very much. Um, I didn't know exactly how to put this talk together, so I hope I don't bore you too much. But uh, I ran the, uh, I didn't run CTIP as a co director. I'll just clarify that. But uh, I uh, ran one of their uh, major programs, and co chaired one of their major programs on early therapeutics. So I am a medical oncologist. I'm not a genomics expert at all. I'm a clinical trialist, but uh, realized early on how important genomics was going to be. And all of the omics, um, as Dr. Green had said, as we move forward in both diagnosing, as you've heard from him from a non-oncology perspective, as well as therapeutic interventions, not only for targeted therapy, specifically focusing on molecular aberrations, as you'll see in the next several minutes, but also for other therapies as well, um, especially as we move forward in the immunotherapy landscape, as we'll be talking about in the next several minutes. So um, I've been very, very fortunate in that um, over the last 26 years of my academic career, I've been integrally involved in 17 now FDA-approved drugs. And at first, I used to look at it as an embarrassment because some of these drugs had maybe a one to one and a half month median um, survival advantage, as an example. But in retrospect, it's really taught me a lot and made me realize the urgency and need for integrating science into the clinical arena. So in oncology, at least the war on cancer, uh, which is what we in the United States focus on, uh, it really began on December 23rd, 1971 when President Nixon, as you can see, signs the $1.6 billion cancer bill and names man to, to head, and he named the man to help fight the disease. But basically, when we started this war, or when we declared the war on cancer and went to battle for it, we had a lot of misnomers, and we were really not equipped. We went into the battlefield without the appropriate weapons. You know, many people thought that cancer was somewhat one disease, and we really didn't have, as I said, the necessary tools, but I don't think we even had the prepared minds that we needed relative to what we know today. And when I'm teaching my medical students and my fellows, I tell them that it's akin to Galileo and the telescope back in 1610. Galileo was almost imprisoned for some of his beliefs. I know there's historians here who can probably clarify this. But basically, he felt that there were other planets in the universe for which there were moons that rotated. And people just, you know, just thought he was kind of crazy. But it wasn't until he developed the next generation telescope that allowed him to see those moons, those four moons rotating around Jupiter. He had to develop the tool. However, even with that tool, there were many people that looked in that telescope that he created and couldn't see the four moons rotating around Jupiter. And basically, it was a paradigm shift, and it completely changed the view that everything orbited around the Earth. And the analogy, I think, is that with prepared minds using new technology, we can recognize that, number one, all cancer is not the same. And I, we, however, we still need to find new moons, but I think we're getting closer to Jupiter. So I use this as a very poor slide, but it comes from one of my mentors, Dr. Tom Corbett. When we signed the war on cancer, we were essentially using this relatively archaic screen. We would test drugs, just drugs, that came through the NCI portfolio. And a lot of the work on drug development was in the NCI's hands. And they used in vivo tumor models, models that were implanted in mice. And there were primarily four different tumors that they used in their screens. And as you can tell, the majority of them were either a leukemia type of tumor or a rapidly growing tumor with a doubling time, that, uh, a rapid half-life. And they really, really were not really indicative of solid tumors that we see in humans. And so basically, this was the primary screen. And a drug had to pass this primary screen and be active, as you can see, at least 25% increased lifespan before the decision network committee would take it forward into further drug development. And as a result, what we got early on and what we were working with back then were very archaic tools, but they were very leukemia focused. And as a result, you saw a lot of activity in the leukemia models. But then when they went into secondary evaluation in solid tumors, such as pancreas and colon cancer, 
and even breast cancer, there was very little activity, understandably so, because their primary screening was very generic, very archaic. It was a leukemia model, and basically also murine leukemia, not human leukemias. And so what we found back then were a lot of drugs that were active against leukemias, and many of these are still used in the leukemic landscape today, but very few that were really active against human solid tumors. And that's where the majority of cancers, at least 85 to 88 percent, rest in the solid tumor landscape in humans. But then something miraculous happened. Um, the human genome was sequenced. Um, you know, Watson and Crick obviously discovered the double helix or reported on it in 1953. And approximately 50, 50 years later, we cloned the human genome. But it was 32 years after Nixon declared the war on cancer. A lot of time went by before we were able to really get more sophisticated tools that would help us. And this was such an event that April 25th, 2003, was actually declared National DNA Day. And this was actually the kickoff of genomic medicine, which is where we're moving into the omic landscape in oncology or cancer treatment. And like Dr. Green told you, initially it took several years and almost $3 billion. And today the change is you can put your, you can put your blood and you can put the tumor into an Illumina 2500 and you can get your readout, or at least you can get the raw data in 27 hours, and the cost is significantly less, and the coverage is significantly greater, allowing us to get maximum information, or at least significantly greater information today than we had back in the olden days. Kind of like when you for, first bought your first calculator, if you're my age, it had four functions, and it was about $260. And today you can go to the dollar store and get a four function you might not even be able to find one, but at least a 16 or 32 function calculator for probably less than $10. A significant advance and a significant alteration of cost. But one of the things we've learned is that cancer is extremely complex. And there's multiple different pathways predicated on many, many different factors, including the genomics of the tumor, you know, what the exogenous uh, causes that may have precipitated it, whether or not it was a germline event, et cetera, et cetera. But the longer the tumor grows, the greater the probability that you're going to alter many different pathways within that and make it much more complicated to treat. And what's really interesting is in just the 10 years since we've had that genome that, or the, the tools to clone the human genome, we now have in the literature reportings of at least 30,000 tumors and at least 123 uh, studies. So there's massive amounts of information that we have now gained in such a short period of time relative to those first 32 years. And what it's also done is it's taken us from the molecular light being turned off to the molecular light being turned on, where back in the olden days, back in the 1970s, when we were treating patients with cancer after the war was declared, we essentially only had clinical outcome data to look at basic lab data to look at. We started with cytogenetics somewhere along the line, but now today we have multiple different tools that can help us both diagnose and treat the disease. And it took us from a histologic diagnosis where we would say this patient has adenocarcinoma of the lung to a totally unique model where we've now been able to genomically subcategorize these tumors into multiple, this one particular tumor into multiple different types of tumor, which will lead us to various concepts in terms of how we are going to treat this tumor in 2015. But it also tells us now why these common cancers, like lung cancer, which is probably the number one killer of cancers in the United States, is so difficult to treat because we are not treating one disease. We're treating a myriad of different diseases based not only on the patient, but if it's metastatic, we also run into other issues as well. However, it has allowed us to begin to look at personalized cancer therapy, whereas back in the olden days, we would treat all these people with the same drug. We now can subcategorize them and hopefully move forward to be able to treat just unique subsets of patients with different drugs or drug combinations based on what their molecular signature looks like. 
And it has allowed us to develop drugs in those 10 years. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of single drug therapy, which is uncommon in the metastatic setting, but using single drug therapy to treat these patients based on what their molecular signature was. A very rare, a rare hematologic disease that before this had really no therapeutic treatment, and these patients did not do well at all. As you can see, just treating this patient with an anti-IL-6 compound based on what they identified in her signature after two doses of drugs, significantly better, and after six doses, you can barely see the disease. Many other examples, for instance, and I was told to bring these up to show you. This is a 57-year-old Caucasian male that was treated on one of our phase one trials who had a rare tumor, an ampulla evader tumor, which is right near the opening that leads to the um, duct that goes into the pancreas. And as you can see here, this was his tumor on baseline scan. This patient underwent whole genome sequencing of both tumor and normal cells. And basically, this is what we sometimes use. This is one of the tools that we use that the genomics people will give us. This is what's called a circos plot, where we can look at the germline or inherent um, molecular aberrations of the patient uh, itself. And then we can also look at the tumor, as you can see here. And I can't read these things, but I can tell you that the guys that I work with do. Um, and basically, for some odd reason, they can understand what this means. But I take that they're telling me the truth. And one of the things they found in this patient, that he had a KRAS mutation, which is common in about 96% of pancreatic cancers, although this was an ampular avatar primary. And he also had this little deletion here in P10. And we were able to treat this patient with GDC0941 that works downstream in the PI3 kinase pathway. And as you can see here, baseline after cycle one and after cycle two, using the genomics that we identified or the molecular signature that we identified in the tumor, the somatic mutations matched against the germline to be able to come up with a meaningful therapeutic intervention, as you can see here. And I think one of the most impressive studies that I've been involved with is the hedgehog pathway inhibitor GDC0449. This is a rare mutation in many malignancies, and in, 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 this is a rare mutation, and basal cell carcinoma, the skin that metastasizes, is not as common, although I, they came out of the woodwork when I first started this trial. And basically, this is another aberration where there's either loss of patch or there's an activating smoothen mutation, or there's a ligand here that binds to the, um, to the patch receptor that prevents it to inactivate smoothen. And what happens in this scenario is that many patients can that have basal cell carcinoma have one of these molecular aberrations in the hedgehog pathway. And when we blocked these, these, this pathway with GDC0449, which is a drug that's now FDA approved, Vismotigib, we saw dramatic results in, our, in many of the patients that were treated on this study that had this tumor and the molecular aberration within it. Unfortunately, though, this drug was not as easily tolerated, number one. And number two, the majority of these patients all recurred, or their tumor came back, and usually came back with a vengeance several months after initiating the treatment. With many of these small molecules, the treatment is not long standing. But there was a study that Rizal Kurzrock's team did at MD Anderson, which said, what if we know the genomic signature of the tumor, and we can identify a drug to treat that tumor that matches that signature? Will those patients that have matched therapy do better than those patients that do not? And this is what we call a waterfall plot, and anything below the line is a positive. And as you can see here, many of these patients that had matched therapy had a really nice response. And if they're below this 30% line, we call that a partial or a complete response, leading to about 27% of patients responding with matched therapy versus only 5% of patients that did not get matched therapy responded. But what was even more impressive was that it also translated into a survival advantage for these patients. And as you can see here in terms of month, months, a huge differential in terms of those patients that responded on matched treatment or those patients that were given matched treatment on this study versus those that did not.
This is just another scenario by the Princess Margaret group, again, showing that in matched patients, there's a 61% overall benefit with a response of 20% in their study versus only 32% with only an 11% response rate if those patients were treated with unmatched treatment. Lending support to the fact that if you can identify the drugs to attack the molecular aberrations in the tumor, you may be able to enhance the therapeutic outcome for our patients. But there are a lot of challenges with this that I'm going to be talking about. The first thing is this. As you can see here, you may not understand this, but a lot of us that are in the arena see this with every talk. The first challenge is the molecular evolution of cancer and that many tumors have multiple aberrations. And uh, as you see here, as you go farther and farther to the right, there's more and more somatic mutations within these tumors. And as you can see here, the tumors that tend to have the most molecular aberrations or somatic mutations tend to be the tumors that are most frequently associated with exogenous or environmental factors that lead to the disease, with melanoma being the greatest culprit, lung cancer, squamous cell, which is associated with smoking, bladder cancer, which many bladder cancers are associated with certain chemical exposures. These patients, or these tumors, tend to have the greatest number of somatic mutations if they're environmentally induced. And they also tend to be the ones that are the hardest to treat, because there's so many different mutations relative to our drug portfolio that we just can't, we just can't get a grasp on treating it if we were only going to go after targeted therapy based on genome sequencing alone. But there's also another problem. In addition to these tumors having more and more somatic mutations as you become, uh, as they're environmentally induced, as a cancer metastasizes and goes to different parts of the body, in this case a breast cancer that's metastasized to the liver and also the lungs, as it goes to other places, it also develops other molecular aberrations. And so what you biopsy in the breast or the liver or the lung may not necessarily look the same in terms of molecular aberrations. And so that too becomes a huge challenge as we're trying to treat these people, especially patients that have metastatic or advanced disease. And I think the number two challenge is that each person or individual has unique tumor heterogeneity. The question I ask and the question that I believe or the, what I believe is that no two patients really have the same tumor when it comes to metastatic disease. What if every patient with metastatic disease was different, like all of these different snowflakes? You can't generically treat those patients all with the same drug if you're targeting their tumor based on molecular aberrations and you don't look at them. And I think a case in point was this publication that came out last year, again by Rizal Kurzrock's group, where in a clinical trial they recruited a fair number of breast cancer patients. And again, as you look down the list here in these patients, no two patients' tumors had the same molecular aberration which makes it extremely challenging in 2015 if we're going to bring a patient in for cancer treatment and generically treat them without looking at their tumor profile. But one of the other challenges, major challenges currently is, although we've got this sophisticated technology and tools and now we can do it faster and we can do it cheaper, one of the main problems is that we don't have drugs to treat or target or attack many of those mutations or aberrations. And this is a study that Fundamerick published a few months ago in JCL, where of 2,000 patients that underwent genomic testing at the MD Anderson's Phase I program, only 3%, or 54 of those patients, could receive genotype-matched treatment. Number one, because many of the drugs don't exist yet. Number two, there are many aberrations in many of these tumors. It's not one single mutation in many of these tumors, and we don't have the drug combinations yet. This is just another study by Bedard that showed that only 5% of his patients were recruited based on profiling, as you can see, again, of close to 2,000 patients. One of, the other con one of the other problems and one of the other challenges, as I said, is that there are limitations of targeted therapies. At our institution, we routinely do 409 gene panel on our phase one patients. 
And 400 gene panel can help you define approximately 20,000 mutations. However, one of the limitations, especially if you're not going to recruit these patients to a clinical trial with a new drug, is FDA approval of targeted therapy is very limited, with roughly only 30 to 35 drugs FDA approved, with very, very limited targets relative to 409 you know, genes with 20,000 mutations. Not saying that all of those mutations are going to be relevant, relevant relative to cancer diagnosis and treatment, but our, our armamentarium of treatment is sure uh, significantly smaller than what we're dealing with in terms of having to treat. And then there's the, sorry about this, it didn't come out, there was a graph here, but there's a limitation of response durability in that a lot of these targeted drugs, you may get a response, but it's very, very short-lived. And many times when the tumor comes back, again, it comes back with a vengeance. And then, as I said, there are challenges of single-agent targeted drugs. How many good drugs have been missed because they needed to be used in drug combination? And this is a study that I was part of back, wow, many years ago, actually, when I was just starting as a, a junior faculty, and I was in the lab, and we, we, we had a program project grant to do early drug development, and we were doing it in combination with Pfizer, and these are two drugs that I looked at in monotherapy. I worked in the MEK pathway, the MAP kinase pathway, for years. But I looked at it, and I looked at this other drug that was part of our study, PD032332991, um, which was a CDK46 inhibitor, which was just FDA approved last year under the name of Pelvocyclob, many years after we studied it in the lab. We didn't know what the genomics of this tumor was at that time. Remember, that was way more than 10 years ago. But one of the things I did know with this tumor model was that if I gave a MEK inhibitor by itself, I got some response. If I gave 991 alone, I got nothing. But when I gave them together, I got a phenomenal response relative to each drug individually. I didn't know at that time that this was a KRAS mutant tumor. And now I know by working at PDX models that have been sequenced, then when I give these two drugs together in combination in KRAS mutant colon cancer, I fare significantly better than either drug alone, which barely has any monotherapy activity. How many drugs have we missed in the clinic because we haven't been able to give the drugs the right way, which may mean in combination? And the reason why a lot of these combinations are important is because there are many different pathways that are activated, and we're trying to target those different pathways at the same time. And if you hit one of them and don't hit the other, or you inhibit one of the pathways, you can upregulate another pathway, and it, it just doesn't do any good to just hit one of the pathways. And we used to think that pushing MEK inhibition was the most important thing because the MAP kinase pathway we thought was pivotal. But we realize now that we really don't have to push MEK as much as CDK in the preclinical models to enhance the therapeutic benefit. And this is just looking at one of our PDX models um, that we've, we've done that in, but we've done it with many. But because of the limitations with genomic-based treatments, both in terms of defining the drugs, not being able to give them in combination, if we do have them because of overlap and toxicity, and not knowing how to give them in combination, in large part because we can't yet define the most activating uh, mutations, as an example, there's been a big push, obviously, for immunotherapy, which has been a phenomenal advance in the treatment of cancer. And there are many different targets we now know that we can target to elicit or affect the immune, uh, immune response. And there are many different targets that we are developing drugs against. And one of the most common drugs right now that's been FDA approved and most efficacious is PDL1, as you can see here, which involves priming and activation. And we're very involved in that because of Li Ping Cheng, who actually discovered PD-1 or developed the antibody against PD-1, who we work with very closely at our institution. And one of the things that it showed, and this was nivolumab, which was one of the first uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors that was developed, is that when you gave this drug relative to docetaxel in, in squamous cell lung cancer patients who had failed frontline treatment, you got a survival advantage. You may not have gotten a progression-free survival advantage. You may not have seen a big difference early on, but those patients tended to live longer. And with immunotherapy, when you do get a response, it seems that those patients do well for a significantly longer period of time 
than many of the targeted drugs that we were able to use. And so what it's done is that you may not see that initial differential like you might have seen with the targeted drugs, but you see a more du du durable response. And so the question is, is, is there a place for combining targeted therapy with immunotherapy, potentially less toxicity than putting two targeted drugs together and potentially being able to work on multiple different mechanisms to be able to enhance the response for our patients. And how is genomics, does genomics fare in relative to immunotherapeutic responses? And this was a patient, paper that uh, Naya Rizvi just recently published where he did look at mutational landscape in patients with non-small cell lung cancer that were treated with the PD-1 immune checkpoint inhibitor. And basically what he determined was that mutational landscape did determine response. And as you can see here, in those patients that had durable clinical benefit, overall the number of non-synonymous mutations, both in, um, in the melanoma studies that were done, as well as, and even more so, in the lung cancer studies that were done, the greater the number of non-synonymous mutations, the greater the clinical benefit with immune checkpoint therapy. Again, genomics is not only limited to targeted drugs against mutations, but it also is very important in understanding the biology of immunotherapy. Again, these tumors with the greatest molecular aberrations were the patient, the tumor types that have responded best currently to immune checkpoint therapy. So it's very important, we feel now, and we've been doing this routinely in most of our trials, is that it's not only important to sequence the tumor cells, but it's also important to sequence certain immune cells and certain immune receptors, like the T cell receptor, and to help understand. And we've been looking at that, and there's some studies that have shown that T cell receptors that seem to be homo, uh, sequence, sequence results that seem to be relatively homogeneous are those that derive the greatest benefit and patients have the best response. And also, if we have this data set, it may help us guide future drug combinations, as I alluded to previously. But I think one of the things I've learned over the last 25 years is that back in the olden days when I first started practicing medicine, I was very lucky that I spent six years in the lab before I really uh, got out into the clinical landscape. And so I was very fortunate in preclinical drug development in that it helped me understand it. But there was this thing where the physicians did their thing and the scientists did their thing, and unfortunately there was this, 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 this river between us. But it's not that way anymore, and it can't be that way anymore. As Dr. Green showed you, and I've showed you in a few scenarios, it's very important for the scientists and the clinicians to work closely together. And I think that's been the renaissance in translational research, where scientists are now starting to think like clinicians, and physicians need to become scientists, or at least translational scientists. But I think the impact of genomic medicine oncology has led to multiple things. Obviously, you've seen today there's prominent technical and bioinformatics advancement. And by the way, most bioinformaticians are some of the best, or ex-physicists or mathematicians. There's understanding the basis of cancer development and tumor progression. It's helped us understand prominent changes in the classification of tumors. It's no longer becoming histology dependent. We have new diagnostic tests and methods. You've seen that, especially with Dr. Green's talk. Therapies that are directed to specific mutated targets and pathways. Understanding what the mutations are or the pathway aberrations has helped us develop new drugs. We understand the association now between genomic instability and anti-tumor immune response, or we're beginning to understand that there's a definitive relationship that needs to be explored in greater detail. And it's helping us, importantly, discover resistance mechanisms. And Genomics and personalized medicine is really coming at the forefront. And we all know January 20th, uh, President Obama stated that night that tonight I'm launching a new precision medicine initiative to bring us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes. But what is it going to take? This is just a scenario of what we do in our Stand Up to Cancer project. And there are a lot of steps involved from taking the tumor from the patient and then delivering the data back to the physician to give treatment to the patient. 
and it is extremely intensive and takes a lot of technology and manpower, even if you can sequence the whole genome in 27 hours. We have clinical collaborators. We have to have a CLIA environment because of FDA and government regulations and Medicare regulations. We have to have the dedicated technology, and it's there. But trust me, some of these machines are extremely expensive. We have to have the HPC infrastructure, a validated pipeline. We have to be able to generate a report that people can understand. And even with that report, many times it's extremely complicated. And we need tumor boards and data sharing to help figure out, with that data, where are we going to go. It takes an army, almost, in terms of technology, uh, skill sets of people, drugs, et cetera, to be able to get this precision medicine um, technology down and to be able to put it into practice. It's not as simple as we would hope it would be. Maybe one day we can spit into a bottle and, you know, it'll give us this printout and we can go to the drugstore and figure out what drug we're going to get. But currently it's a lot more complicated than that when it comes to identifying how we are going to treat patients with a lot of molecular aberrations. So you saw this in the previous slide, and I look at it from a physician's perspective. As a clinician, we're given tons of data. There's tons of data being thrown at us, and tons of different patients with tons of data. And it's becoming challenging, but we're starting to work through those challenges to try to figure out how we're best going to interpret all that data so that hopefully we'll be able to open our eyes sooner and that the water flow won't be as, 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 as strong and we'll be able to figure out exactly where to go with all that data that's coming at us. This is just our Stand Up to Cancer Melanoma Dream Team that I'm a co-PI on with Dr. Jeff Trent. And it's taken people all over the United States to be able to help us, both in terms of the biology of the disease, but also in the treatment of those patients. And more importantly than that, it's one of the only personalized medicine trials that has gone forward to the FDA that's been written by an, a, a person instead of a drug company. And basically, this was one of the landmark and first personalized medicine trials that was an investigator-initiated trial, and we had to work closely with them. But you can imagine how much time it took me to write a 2,500-page document to do one clinical trial. But nobody had ever done prospective assessment of deep exome RNA-seq against matched normals and come out with treatment recommendations. And so it took a lot of um, working with the FDA to be able to figure out how to move that technology forward within the context of a prospective treatment decision-making trial, which looks pretty simple, but is not as easy as it sounds. And it took us, you know, initially we thought five weeks from biopsy to th therapeutic decision making. And with advanced technology, during just the time period that we've developed this trial, we've been able to get this down to about 10 to 12 days. And this is basically what we're doing. You know, we have these tumor boards, and they show us the data, and they show us this is just one of five pages of level one mutations. These are very, very com complex tumors. All of these patients also have failed immunotherapy because that's frontline recommended for this patient population. And we have to come up with, within the context of a drug pharmacopoeia of roughly 50 agents, what drugs we are going to choose. And unfortunately, most of our patients would require combinations if we had our way. But unfortunately, that's not what the FDA allowed us to do within the context of this trial. So in terms of challenges, it isn't about revealing the tumor genomics. It's about determining the most relevant aberration to target drugs and drug combinations within the context of our trial and many other trials as well. But genomics, as you can see here, is just the tip of the iceberg. As Dr. Green told you, there are many other things that are going to be equally important as we move forward to be able to best define the disease that we're calling cancer, and equally, if not more importantly, to find how we are going to attack it because it's going to take this entire iceberg, I believe, to be able to make the most solid impact against this disease. And I just want to leave you with this one, one scenario. Brooke Hester was a four-year-old when she was diagnosed with an abdominal neuroblastoma, and she was put on one of the trials that I was involved in. It was a pediatric trial, but I helped the PI of this trial write this study. 
And basically, when she was told that there was nothing left to do, and that you know her parents were resigned to almost hospice, they sought out this clinical trial. And we did biopsy her, matched it against germline, identified a treatment, she responded. We biopsied her again. And then we biopsied her again when she progressed again. And this young girl had four responses with four different biopsies. Unfortunately, only about a year to eight to 14 month responses with each of these individual treatments. Like I said, this targeted therapy by itself is very difficult in terms of long-term responses. But with genomic, with genomic profiling, we were able to buy her four additional years. Um, her brother got to meet her, um, and uh, they became friends for a short while. But unfortunately, the fourth biopsy didn't help us too much, and she ended up dying. But genomics has impacted patient outcomes. But I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg there as well in terms of what the benefits will be for our patients, because I think the benefits will be great. I have to believe it because I've seen too many patients in my lifetime. I only treat metastatic patients, so I see a lot of devastation, not only with the patients themselves, but equally, if not more importantly, with the families that have to suffer the long-term outcomes. And with that, I thank you.